What's up everybody, NEXT here, coming to you from my new home in Luxor, Egypt. That's right, this is the first video that I'm publishing since moving here to Egypt. And I do have a new playlist series that I'm putting together that is entitled Living in Luxor. I've already started that playlist, you can check it out. I'm going to be adding videos to that playlist more frequently. It's basically going to be a, a vlog series that documents my day-to-day -day adventures and experiences experiences here living in Luxor so you can learn what it's like to be an American expat with his family here in Luxor. I'm going to take you behind the scenes into my home and and it's going to be a more personal approach but I'm still going to continue doing my videos exploring the ancient mysteries and investigations into ancient civilizations. That said this video is a continuation of my Sphinx series which you can find on the Great Sphinx of Egypt playlist here on this channel. This is a continuation of our journey inside the Sphinx enclosure. I'm going to be taking you back inside the Sphinx enclosure with myself and Dr. Manu Safe today so we can talk about the water erosion, you can get an up close look at the erosion for yourself, we'll discuss the fissure, and Manu will explain why, according to Dr. Robert Schock's experiment, the Sphinx cannot be older than 10,000 BC. Stay tuned for another adept expedition. Manu, by the way, has written an academic paper with Dr. Shock. This is your time to explain shock, how shock comes into the fold. And then we're going to walk over to the fissure and begin looking at the evidence. Okay, well, um, he basically, he, he observed two things. The first thing is, as Lex just pointed out, is the water erosion. The water erosion, there's a very important aspect to it that you have to remember when you go to the other side, eventually, if you can venture out, there is a couple of mastabas, they're rock cut, and that is the negative control for Robert Schock's observation about vertical erosion here, because you don't see it over there, okay? That, there's a key observation. You always need a negative control, something to compare what you're seeing, okay? You don't see this kind of erosion anywhere else, and that's the key. So that's the first thing. The second thing is the decay underground, right? That's the seismic refraction I just referred to. And when you come and the water erosion, like Next just said, you don't know when all that water came down, right? We know that it was something like 10,000 years ago, but it could have been 30,000, 50,000 years. We just don't know, right? However, when you look at the seismic refraction data, you do actually get an answer to this question, okay? And that, that the answer to that question is, it could not have been more than about 10,000 BC. Because when you look at the surface, the, the, the underground decay, that is the limit. So initially, like Next just pointed out, Shock was a little bit conservative. He said, well, maybe it's 7,000 BC or something like that. But in the later years, he realized, well, you know what? Comfortably, the geologists can say it goes back to 10,000. It is my best date, at least 10,000 BC now. And I talk about that in great detail, the origins of the Sphinx. But it does not go back to 20,000, 50,000, 800,000. You know, you might see all of these things on the internet. No, right. that is one of the few data sets that we have that actually falsify something. And what it falsifies is that it can be older than, let's say, 10,000 BC. So yeah, I just because wanted to point this out. Yeah. So those are the key observations of Robert Chalk, and they corroborate each other. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the important thing. Basically, it's water erosion on the walls of the Sphinx enclosure, on the Sphinx, and this cannot have occurred during the hyper-arid conditions of the Sahara Desert over the last 5,000 years. And it's not Nile flooding, forget that. that that's just, doesn't work geologically. Um, it would cause undercutting that you don't see. Everything I'm telling you, by the way, I learned from Robert Schock. I'm not a geologist, okay. I'm a scientist, so I know how to do a science experiment, but the, anything that I say, geologically speaking, comes from Robert Schock. So I, I'm not speaking on his behalf. He's really the ultimate authority. But so I want to show you something. Look at that, you see that fissure? That is not a vertical water erosion. That is a natural fissure in the rock, okay? So that's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is, you can see it here, right? You see this sort of candle wax effect. And so where do you see that over there? Can somebody point this out? Where do you see the candle wax effect? Yeah, that's right, exactly, right. See, there's t three tiers, right? And why is it more pronounced on the, on the lower tier? Why do, why do you think? Why is it more pronounced? 
That's one explanation, that's right. And then also it, the water is gushing down from, it's a catchment, right? The, the back of the Sphinx serves as a catchment for the water and then it flows over the edge and it hits that third tier the hardest. And that's why it erodes like that, okay? The third tier is the top one. Yeah, so as I bet you, there's three separate levels of rock strata and you can see how the head looks different from the body and the head being the hottest at the top. And just to add from a symbolist point of view, this head here would represent the intellect of man, the consciousness of man, his ability to connect with the divine on top of the body, which is the power of the animal. There's a very deep philosophy to this. The pharaoh was actually a prototype for what all man could become in terms of reconnecting with source. This is going to be on a more metaphysical, esoteric side, but we're going to continue now with Manu and the geological features. So th th this is on this side, right? On the other side, you will not see so much of this vertical catalog effect, okay? Yeah, yeah the great for sure. So pay attention now when you go on the other side so you can compare the two sides, okay? And why is that? Because the back of the Sphinx isn't exactly horizontal, right? It dips a little bit to this side. So it makes sense, right? The water is flowing this way, and that's why it's more pronounced on that side. Okay, so now let me talk about the Great Fissure. So this is the Great Fissure, okay? This is not a water erosion feature, it, but it is a major defect in, the, in, the, in this part of the Mokatan. This is, this is their covering up the evidence here. This hasn't always been here. This has been put up in, what is this, Sahel, about half a decade now, maybe five years ago, six years ago. Yeah. You used to be able, there was a photo of John Anthony West standing inside. And it happened, you see that block here, the, the white uh, stones, blocks mm -hmm. here. This was a hole made because of, you see how this, it's descending, the, the, yes. the, yeah. uh, the descent of the whole uh, uh, plateau down here. So when there was, Huge water, Nile, uh, sorry, uh, rain water, not Nile. Nile is different kind of uh, erosion. Much water gushed like this in here. Of course, it has affected here and, and precipitation in here and here. And actually, there's a place in the front. We take you in the front after the new uh, show. So the fissure basically splits the monument into a back portion and a front portion. And Chuck and I we published a paper proposing that that actually inspired the, some of the first hieroglyphic symbols in ancient Egypt, the front of the line and the back of the line. And more importantly, the back of the line is actually the symbol for Heka magic. Okay, that is the symbol. So what you're looking at here, this portion behind the split, that is the symbol, hieroglyphic symbol for magic. And I'm sure Next is going to talk about this during the tour. Yes. But I just want to point this out. So we think that is one piece of evidence why that this was here before the ancient Egyptians invented writing, okay, which is like 3150 BC. So that's just one other piece of the puzzle, okay? So also, that's the great fissure. you notice how many different blocks they have been added to it, you see? So this is old kingdom. You, you will learn or you, you can get it. T typically the larger stones yeah, are old kingdom. This is very new. So it's been always in a state of Right, S some are modern, modern day. You have the Ptolemaic so I Roman to repair. Give away, to give away my second book, okay? So the first one was the, remember, whoever can find the Herakta symbol. So whoever tells me what, what layer this is, gets the second book. Okay? Oh, the first layer. The member one, right? Member one, one, yeah. One, so where is that on the other side? That's up above. You got it. Okay, but, All right, uh, Derek wins the book in the contest. My no. My no. What about attention. what about the flakes? <laughs> yeah, that's exfoliation, right? So this is this has been going on for maybe a long time, but especially during modern times because smog in the air, right? And also salting underground water seeps up into the rock. But and they then are so into the it contours and it, it dissolves it dissolves the minerals inside the stone and then it comes it sweats out during the heat, right? And then all that mineral comes out as these plates. Here's an example and and Honoring my teacher, John Anthony West, we call these laner flakes because Mark <laughs> Laner, but you see how easy they, they crumble. And this has to do with the water erosion theory because the academics are at odds with, you know, John, Ant well, really John Anthony West and Dr. Robert Schock are at odds with the academics. There are some different theories. They don't accept the water erosion theory. There's the salt crystallization theory. What they believe is water under the plateau would rise up. The, the Sphinx, the porous limestone would soak it all up 
and it would be crumbling from from the inside out essentially so it's called spalling by the way spalling spalling it happens to granite but it's it's the top flakes coming off that's the weathering process. did you guys see the look at how it's like a you see it's a big groove oh, yeah. look how huge it is they did not really cover this evidence very much like this one go see? back in there we'll get a picture go ahead <laughs> And we are going to stop it right here. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did enjoy the video, please give it a like. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And remember to click the bell icon for updates on future videos. If you like what I'm doing, if you appreciate the content that I keep delivering for you, please do consider giving some back this way by supporting this channel and my work on Patreon. You can find the link down below. And I think I can hear the prayer call in the back. Yep, can you guys hear that? Right on cue, prayer call here in Egypt. And so if you, uh, again, if you wanna support the channel, please do consider Patreon as an option. It's in the description below. Another way that you can support is by coming on one of our tours uh, where I can take you exclusively inside the Sphinx enclosure, which is not open to the general public. We will be going back in on my September tour with Johanna James, which is now unfortunately sold out. But I am going to be announcing another tour this year, so stay tuned. You can get updates and early bird discounts. The best way to get a discount on my tours is by visiting my site, adeptexpeditions.com, signing up for the email list, and that way you can get updates for future tours and discounts. Let us know your thoughts and what you think about what was discussed inside the Sphinx enclosure by leaving a comment down below. I'll try to reply to as many comments as I can. Got all sorts of sounds here in Egypt. Nature sounds, loud sounds, the prayer call. Anyway, this is NEXT for Adept Expeditions, signing out. The book of yes. hidden under the feet of Orm Achet, right? Yes, yes, What the magical yes, papyrus yes. says. So it's interesting that Tatmos actually recreated this very image right here. You can see, where is it? Oh. It's in the cookie. <laughs> Here's the winner of our contest, Crystal. Yeah, what's up? I like represent. <laughs> How do you feel, Crystal? I don't know. I mean, like, always. I'm just kidding. I don't know. Thank you. <laughs>